Well, uh, hello everyone. I'm here to talk about how we use um, uh, data in video games. Here's some stuff I've worked on, some companies I've worked at. Uh, a very fair question is, well, why games? Uh, if you would have told me 15 years ago when I wanted to work in the industry that data and analysis would be a big part of it, I would have had no idea. Uh, and there's a uh, Gabe Newell, the guy who founded Valve Software, uh, was recently asked by a student, like, what's the mo I want to I make games, what's the most important thing? And he said, an iterative cycle. Uh, and this is, over the past 10 years, as we've become digital live services, uh, this is everything that pretty much we do. Uh, and it's a, oh, sorry, I'll go back one slide. <laughs> but, and in particular with games, it's a great learning environment because you make so many changes so often to so many people. Even games that aren't particularly successful will have hundreds of thousands of people playing them every day, where you're making many, many changes each week, so it's a great environment to learn. Uh, and what have we learned? <laughs> Most of the time, people don't care. Uh, if, if you took a stack of all the changes I've seen personally made in games over all the various companies and all of our various projects, most of the time there's no measurable impact. So then the question is, if this is the game that we're playing, uh, what's the best strategy to play it? Uh, and this, the approach we take is really simple. We just try to, find the, try to find the things that have any measurable impact, positive or negative. We'll go through a product very quickly, very brutally, without a, lot of without a lot of design sensibility and just make big changes and just see what changes behavior, because most things don't. Uh, and that allows us to identify the things to focus on. Now, that's just sort of the high level context of how this process was built up. Because when we're in that kind of situation, uh, the difference between being a little bit better and your success rate of making decisions is basically what means you're gonna win. So how do we actually do this? Uh, it's all about process. Uh, forget high five moments, the best ideas. It's even kind of a joke in the industry to be like the idea guy is like a, a, a bad thing. Ideas are, are really not what matters. Uh, the hard part is knowing, uh, having a process that helps you de decide the one thing that actually has a good chance of having an impact and prioritizing that. The theoretical framework for that is the scientific process. You make a hypothesis, uh, you design an experiment, and you test it and analyze it. But a much more practical framework comes from the US military uh, called the OTA loop, uh, observe, orient, uh, decide, and act. Uh, and the, the use of this framework is really simple. If you close this loop faster than your competitors, or per the original offer, author, your enemy, you win. And the key here is that the hardest part is understanding the data. Uh, collecting it, measuring it is really very easy and everyone can do it. Uh, the real trick is knowing what to do with it because we never know why. We have incredible data on the actions of players in games. Uh, some, if something is really important to us, we'll look at a really, really, really small level about the tiniest little actions they're making. But it never tells us why. We still have to figure that out and that's where the decision making part comes in. Uh, and it's it's really, really important to remember uh, that everyone has data, everyone's data-driven, everyone has these reports. The only way to really have a competitive advantage is to make decisions faster and better than your competitors. Cool, all right, so the fun part. You have a product up, it's running, you have users, you have data, and probably you have a dozen or more very clever, very experienced people arguing about what to do next. That's the key part of the process, at least in my opinion. Uh, how do you take all this mess, all this data, and find out which is going to be the cheapest, least risky solution that has the biggest impact and can be done the fastest? The method we use uh, is stolen from finance. It's just very, 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 very boiled down uh, to uh, putting a price on everything. So uh, what is, what's the cost to develop something? What's the risk that that cost is off? Uh, and what's the projected business impact? And what's the risk that that business impact is wrong? You take the inflow of all the ideas from everyone on the team, from CEO, receptionist, whoever, and you price them. And that allows the product owner or the product manager, whoever, to make a decision. Um, and of course, most of the time, <laughs> you're wrong. 
um, most of the time it doesn't work out, and that's when you have to get better at it. And this is the key. No one expects when we release a game that your success rate of changes is going to be very good. Uh, if it's at 5% for the first six months, I think a team is doing quite well. But the key is that rate has to get better. And you do that um, by analyzing things. And the key thing to remember is that money, time, or staff is not your most uh, valuable resource. It's users. Uh, with each user, you can get data from, and if you run the process well, you can get a learning from that, and as a result, you can improve your profitability. Uh, so how do you ensure that this works? How do you ensure that you can, the way that you're making decisions, the way you're learning from your decisions actually goes into a full process? Um, one, of the, one of the easiest ways to mess this up is on the analysis side. Uh, I had the experience uh, of kind of by accident of running a business intelligence department, even though it's not actually what I usually do. And quickly, you'd see that the vast, vast majority of reports that people want to see are a complete waste of time. Uh, in that there's no, there's nothing they can do with it. And a lot of this is because of a good thing. You know, when you work in an organization filled with tons of creative, clever people, they're just curious, which is great. That is not a bad thing at all. And it, it's, it's, it's really a kind of wonderful, interesting thing. And a lot of times, even myself, you're like, oh, I would love to know this. I would love to know that. But BI is an incredibly scarce resource. Uh, the number of the backlog will always be much, 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 much bigger than the time. And just like development time needs to be prioritized, so does analyst time. So I came up with, I did this internally, I didn't say this to people because it's a bit strict, um, but I call it the so what test. So you want to see something, great. Well, so what? So what if it says exactly what you think is going to say? So what if it says the opposite? What are you going to do about it? If there wasn't a clear next step, that item would go to the bottom of the backlog, and I'd make sure that the team is focused on things that are actionable. Uh, so then, again, how do we get better at it? Uh, one of the, now, let's go back to the beginning of this loop when everyone on the team is giving us ideas. Uh, in games, it's, we like to keep it really open, so anyone can come with us with an idea, whether it's you know, CEO, shareholders, receptionists, players, anything, right? But the next step, when we put a price on it, is really the, one of the key weaknesses, because in the beginning, we have no idea what we're doing. We don't know what really motivates players. What are the few things that can actually get them to change their behavior? So uh, we took a process. I was trained on a process at, uh, that supposedly, by rumor, was inspired by the New York City Police Department. Uh, in the 90s, when crime fell by a ton in New York City, uh, it was due, in part, uh, to a data-driven process that they instituted, where every two weeks, uh, the police captain of a region uh, or an area, a precinct, would stand in front of the executives and say, here's the numbers from my district, uh, here's what we did about it in the past, and here's what we're going to do about it in the future. Uh, these were, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the TV show The Wire, uh, that kind of atmosphere. And even at some game companies, they can be like that. Very, very, very hostile. Uh, that's not generally how we do things with them. It's more academic and just sort of peer review is how we see it. Uh, so the way we do it at Rovio is all the product managers get together once a week and in very simple, not pretty, fancy you know, presentations, but just very to the point, here's what we did, here's what we thought was going to happen, and here's what we learned so that from everyone inside the company, I'm getting really, really fast summaries of what they've done so that when I get a similar proposal from someone else, I can put that into context. I can price it just the same way that someone in finance would price an asset by looking at other benchmarks. Uh, so this is how that whole loop closes. Uh, it's a great, great, great process, and though I definitely don't think you should be done in the original way um, of this kind of nasty environment, <laughs> but. Uh, it definitely works really well for us. So uh, I wanted to go on to a few other just sort of key learnings and things and lessons from my experience. There we go. Uh, the vision test. Uh, because product managers and analysts usually aren't brought on into a project until the middle of it, uh, you know, the thing is already mostly built or halfway built, 
And because there's not that many of us, oftentimes we get to choose projects. This is <laughs> how we, at least how I choose. Uh, you meet everyone on the team and you ask, what are you building? If everyone gives you the same answer, then cool, move forward, because this is going to be all right. But if you get a bunch of different answers from different people, then it's, it's time to start over, and that this is not really a, a, a good place to go forward. Uh, the other worst phrase, <laughs> the, the, the single worst phrase you hear is, let's just test it. Because uh, games can, especially in the Facebook phase, would have so many users, your ability to run tests and still get statistically significant numbers was massive. So you, you would sometimes get this environment where people would have a debate. Well, it's, it's all that happens every day. Should we do this? Should we do that? Should we do this? Should we do that? And the decision maker just says, oh, whatever, let's just test it. Uh, this is a massive, massive mistake. The, and this is something we just, I just looked at recently for one of our games in terms of how we were creating value. Uh, and a massive chunk was coming from the tests we were running, the A-B tests, or also sometimes tests in serial, but the, 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 the discrete tests we were doing. If, if we had done not as good of a job, the game would be far, far, far less successful. Why did that happen? Because we were very, very strict about the tests we ran. And just the same way we were strict about what changes we'd make to the game or what analysis we would do, the tests had to have a really clear, strong business case. And in general, that meant doing things that were really, really risky. Um, in games are fortunate in that we have a long period of testing called soft launch, where you release in usually a couple of countries. I like to do dozens. Uh, where you get lots of users and you can test it. And my goal for this phase is always to almost break the game. It's never happened because, of course, it never does. But that's the kind of fear that you want when you're making these changes because that's the only way you're going to have a chance of having any kind of measurable big impact. Cool. All right. Uh, and the last little bit, uh, or at least the last slide, is, uh, is, is, this is actually from the outgoing CTO in the Obama White House. He wrote down these guidelines, which I think he just published them on Twitter. I'm not exactly sure what it was for. But the best advice uh, is the bottom part. <laughs> the what's required to cut the timeline by half and what's required to double the impact. Um, so you know, we talked a lot about all these inflow of ideas, right? And one of the things that I try to do with teams is I, I try to help them pitch their ideas better. Because usually they're quite expensive. We want to build this big, awesome system in the game. Uh, and it's going to take a month or two to do. It means we won't be able to do anything else. And of course, if it works, they'll have some great business impact. But again, most things don't work. So what we try to do is to get people to take their idea and to cut it into something really, really, really small and ugly. Uh, like, we think it would be better if we had it a super competitive area of the game uh, where the most engaged people who spend the most money could just compete with each other and they would, because, of, because it would be a little bit special, a little bit different, uh, we could do all these cool things and whatever. So the, the solution to this isn't to build that, the whole thing. You build, you just cut off some tiny thing, change whatever the few smallest things you can change, do it in a very ugly way, uh, we call it like with designer art, where you just change some colors with the paint bucket. Even this is for a you know, massively successful game. You show it to a small percentage of users, and then you see, is this really worth doing? And that kind of flow where people, everyone on the team, and even executives, receptionists, everyone knows that if they want to get something done, if they, want, if they really believe in their idea, and they really want their pitch to cut through the crowd of all the many ideas everyone has. They need to build a business case. And they can do that by handing us this. Instead of saying, here's this massive big feature that you guys should do, they talk to a data scientist, they talk to a product manager, and they design a test that is tiny, small, and cheap. And if it's successful, we'll make immediately clear that their idea is worth doing. So instead of fighting for months of time, they're fighting for days of time. And not only that, the key here is that they're working directly with analysts and product managers on experimental design, one of the thorniest topics in the world. And 
the, like uh, the previous speaker was even talking about how not a lot of people have direct access to data. Uh, in our industry, it's not a problem because we have tons of that stuff everywhere. But the problem is not really access, it's just the basic training. Like, we don't need everyone on the team to be, you know, statisticians or have math degrees, but just the basics. Just the basics of, well, how do we know, like, when someone says, you know, how long does the test need to run? And an analyst rolls his eyes and says, well, it depends how big the lift is. <laughs> like, it's, it just, you don't have to know how to calculate statistical significance, but if you understand the basic idea. Uh, because the, it helps a lot, uh, especially because people are always worried that things will go wrong in the game, that this will break, that that'll break. Uh, but if you understand those basics uh, by going through this process, with, by working directly with the analysts and the product managers, you get less worried. Because say if we did break the game by the math of statistics, we would know it immediately. We could fix it right away because we wouldn't have to wait to measure it so long. And that's something that, of course, every analyst and every product manager knows, but a lot of other people don't. And I think that that's really the last mile to kind of overstretch that metaphor for data work, is, is, is getting that foundational knowledge on everyone on the team, whether it's an artist, receptionist, CEO, everyone just understands the basics of how we measure things, how we test things, and the, the best thing, I just last little note is the best thing that ever happened to me was someone actually forced me to learn SQL, even though we had like a bunch of team of analysts or whatever. Uh, and I think it's something that more teams should do is in really just the basics. I think it could be, when I go through with, with teams, it, it takes an hour. Uh, of course, they don't always pick it up, um, but if, if there's anything that in my experience makes a massive difference in the productivity and the business impact of a team when they're running a live product with data, it's how well everyone just understands those basics. So if they understand the basics, if they know how to take ideas and cut them down really small and pitch them that way, so we're doing lots of quick, nasty tests that give us an indication of what might actually be successful, and then when we do something, we're only analyzing the things that really matter, and then we're sharing those learnings in clear, simple, three-act stories. Here's what we thought, here's what we did, here's what actually happened. Uh, then you have game teams that can take games that even are kind of middling and not so successful and really grow them. Um, you hear a lot of those stories in the industry. There are certainly lots of instances of them, but getting to that process is super hard, and this is basically how I've seen it done and done it in the past.